Okay, we'll get started. Welcome everybody and uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, McMaster's um, Department of Medicine uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, we've got two speakers today who I'll introduce in one second. Just a couple of quick business items. The first is um, I'm going to do my best to mute and stop video on everybody who's uh, attending, but I may uh, slip a bit. So if you notice anyone speaking or if you notice your speakers on, your, your microphone's on, please mute yourself. Uh, we will have time, I hope, at the end for questions. So two ways of doing questions. The first is you can type them into the chat box, either to me personally or to everyone, and I'll restate them at the end. Um, or secondarily, uh, we, you can unmute yourself at the end and ask the questions. So we have two speakers today. Uh, the first is Dr. Deb Yamamura, who's an associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine, um, has been at McMaster for uh, a few years, almost exactly the same length of time as I have. I didn't realize this, but she did our undergraduate degree in paleontology, which is cool and more interesting than medicine, and has had a number of senior administrative roles, uh, most recently, which is the uh, president-elect for the Association of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases of Canada, and she's also the chair of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons Medical Microbiology Examination Committee. Second speaker is Tony Chetty, who has also been at MAC for some time, um, is the uh, uh, medical biochemistry, uh, is in medical biochemistry at McMaster, and an associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine. He's also the division head of clinical chemistry and immunology, and also has an interest in bariatric medicine. And, and Deb and Tony approached me and asked if they could talk a bit about laboratory <laughs> diagnostics for COVID-19. And so I'll turn it over to Deb. So Deb, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, Dr. Crowther, thanks for inviting Dr. Chetty and me to give grand rounds today. So if everyone would just take note of the attendance code. Uh, so what we're both going to be talking about is diagnostic testing for SARS-CoV-2. Um, I'm going to be focusing uh, a little bit on an overview of the biology and epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2, and then I'm going to focus on a review of the molecular diagnostic testing. And in particular, I'm going to be looking at the accuracy of performance of the assay, looking at the analytical sensitivity and specificity, and also the clinical sensitivity and specificity, and then focusing on the role of specimen type, um, repeat testing, I'll touch on a, a point of care assays, and then uh, discuss testing populations, and Dr. Chetty will be talking about serology. So as we all know, um, SARS-CoV-2 is a single-stranded RNA virus, and there are only seven coronaviruses that infect humans. We're familiar with these four, which uh, cause the common cold, and then what has been interesting is the emergence of novel uh, coronaviruses, which include the SARS virus in 2002, MERS, and uh, SARS-CoV-2. Pretty early on after the uh, emergence of SARS-CoV-2, the whole genome was sequenced, and this was published on January 5th. And once the sequence was published, uh, they were able to then look to see what would be the most likely origin of the virus based on uh, similarity in genetic sequencing. And this highlighted that it was a zoonotic origin and the um, virus is most similar to two bat-derived SARS-like coronaviruses with, um, initially it was 88% uh, um, similarity, although in more recent publications, it was as high as 96. However, it's not similar enough that it was thought to directly jump from the bat over to the humans. And the most likely hypothesis is that there is an intermediate host Early on, the most likely host was thought to be the pangolin. This is still not confirmed, but there is some compelling evidence um, because of similarities in the receptor binding domain, which is quite unique to the SARS-CoV-2 and the pangolin. A genomic diversity is um, interesting to look at. And if you look at the human sequences and this diversity, it allows you actually to determine where the virus may have originated, when, and how it's moved through the world. So in this publication, they looked at the genomic diversity of human sequences, and there were approximately over 7,000 sequences available in the public domain. And what it pointed to is that most likely the common ancestor for the SARS-CoV-2 virus emerged either at the end of November or the beginning of December. You can also look at the genetic diversity in different countries, and this has indicated that there have been multiple independent introductions in most countries, except for China, which makes sense, um, but also Italy, although with Italy, there were a lower number of sequences available, uh, so this has to be factored in. So SARS, um, when it emerged in 2002, had a very severe impact, but if you look at this table, the scale in comparison to COVID-19 was much smaller. 
Uh, the strategy of detection and containment for the SARS virus when it emerged in 2002 and resurfaced in 2003 actually worked very effectively. And this is most likely because there was no pre-symptomatic transmission. And we know that the virus peaked later after symptom onset, which is very different from the SARS-CoV-2. In terms of the epidemiology, some of the earliest uh, case series that came out of China highlighted that the median age was slightly older population at 59 years. And in the uh, more recent uh, case series of hospitalized patients in New York, uh, the age was 63 years. In all the case series that have been published, there is a predominance of male. And this is thought to be related to the fact that males have a higher um, amount of the ACE2 receptor. And this is where the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, uh, binds. And this receptor is found in respiratory epithelial and also in the GI tract. I will highlight that in Ontario, our demographics are slightly different with an increased preponderance of females. I think most of us are familiar with the underlying risk factors, and this includes hypertension and diabetes, and also obesity is now being reported. And the incubation is a median of four to five days. Um, and an early publication highlighted that the majority of cases, 99% of cases, uh, were within an incubation of 14 days, which is what we use, of course, to guide isolation and self-quarantine. The uh, mortality um, in China when uh, it was first reported was approximately 28%. Um, and in the more recent uh, case series in New York, it was slightly lower at 21%. We do know that with severe disease and particularly when there is mechanical ventilation, the mortality increases significantly. And in that New York series, it was 88%. For the clinical symptoms, I'm not really going to discuss the uh, typical symptoms because I think we're all very familiar with that. But what I wanted to do is highlight some of the uh, clinical features that have been most recently reported. If you look at anosmia and dysgeusia, this really was not reported in any of the Chinese case series. And it was only when COVID-19 um, started, uh, was in Europe or North America that we saw an increasing number of reports of anosmia. There is an interesting French paper that was recently published where 47% of their COVID-19 patients had anosmia. Usually um, it occurs around four days after infection. And thankfully there is recovery with 98% recovering uh, in 28 days. There's also been an increasing number of reports of Kawasaki-like disease. And I think this highlights the, the fact that there is dysregulation of the uh, inflammatory response to COVID-19. There, uh, in an Italian paper that recently looked at that, they uh, showed a 30-fold increase in Kawasaki disease since COVID-19 um, emerged. Um, if the adults and uh, the people who deal with adults in this population are familiar with Kawasaki disease, it's a very multiple, multiple factorial disease with conjunctivitis, mepocutaneous inflammation, cardiac abnormalities, and coagulopathy. And this association with COVID-19 has prompted the WHO to come out with a definition of Kawasaki-like disease related to COVID-19. If we look at the Ontario epidemiology, and I think most of us became very good at finding our favorite site to look at the numbers, um, I just wanted to highlight a few things. So as I mentioned, in contrast to all the other country case reports, we do have a preponderance of female patients with uh, 57% of our COVID patients being female. And I think this reflects the fact that a lot of our cases have been uh, focused in the long-term care facilities. We've had over 12% hospitalization and unfortunately 17.1% uh, are healthcare workers. For our mortality, this is consistent with other um, with the epidemiology that has been reported with an increasing mortality rate with age. And I've just put up um, some graphs, which uh, sort of is a good news thing in that our active cases and daily news cases seem to have peaked and are falling. So now I'd like to focus on diagnostic testing for SARS-CoV-2. So in this table, if you look at it, it um, has uh, partitioned off uh, in terms of before symptom onset and after symptom onset. Uh, if you look at the diagnostic test that's most commonly used, it's the nasopharyngeal swab um, using a molecular assay. And as you can see, we are able to detect the virus um, in the pre-symptomatic phase, uh, increasing detection rates as people become symptomatic, and then it falls off with recovery. Um, just want to highlight a few other things. Uh, in red is viral cell culture. Um, and of course, this would be the best uh, correlate with transmissibility. 
And uh, another specimen type that we do not test routinely is stool. And it's well known that this um, uh, COVID-19 can't be detected by molecular assays and it tends to last longer in this type of specimen. However, at this point, there is no evidence that there's any fecal oral transmission. Uh, Tony will be talking later about the serological assays. So this is the uh, Hamilton Regional Lab Medicine Program dashboard that looks at our COVID testing volumes and positivity rates. So on this uh, axis, you have the number of tests. Here you have the positivity rate. And of course, this is time. So our first case in our region was March 9th. And the laboratory had to very quickly uh, try and implement uh, COVID testing to meet the needs of our institution and our regions. And to put it in context, when there's a new assay, whether it be commercial or lab developed, usually we have months in order to um, evaluate, um, uh, operationalize the assay. But with the COVID-19, all laboratories were under a lot of pressure to bring on testing very early. We were able to do that on March 16th. We incorporated the five UTR target of COVID-19 in our regular respiratory uh, multiplex PCR on the BDMAX platform. As volumes increased, we had to quickly look at human resources and we ended up going 24 seven on March 25th. Because the multiplex was looking at other viruses and we started to run into reagent issues and really wanted a focused test just on COVID, we worked on getting a COVID specific assay and the advantage of this one is it actually incorporated two targets, the five UTR and the envelope and we were able to run this on our BD Max. So similar to the hospitals that were having major shortages with PPE, the laboratory was under a tremendous strain because of shortages of reagent. And what this um, prompted laboratories to have to do is to look at different platforms. And this is very unusual. We usually do not have to bring on multiple different platforms to test the same analyte. But manufacturers and vendors were not able to provide the reagents necessary for extraction and PCR. So we had to actually develop, um, put our COVID um, uh, triplex onto another platform, the rotor gene. And this was April 17th. If you look at this graph, you can see that there's a gradual increase in volumes and we're almost at the 1000 mark um, at the beginning of April. And this also um, uh, triggered a look to, uh, for look, looking at automation to decrease the hands-on time in order to ramp up uh, testing. And so we had to bring on liquid handlers and robots at this time. If you look at the rest of the graph, you can see that our capacity is approximately 1200 tests per day, which is huge. And when you think of the short time frame, we were able to ramp up very rapidly. Um, our positivity rate uh, peaked um, at around the beginning of April. Um, quite a few of our positive cases actually came from outside of the Hamilton region, in particular Grand River and St. Mary's. The other thing I wanted to highlight is that the laboratory has always been able to maintain the provincial recommendation of a 24 hour turnaround time. Often that turn turnaround time is less. Um, this is in contrast to the public health lab system, which as you know, has struggled with a prolonged turnaround time. And we have taken on a, a large backlog of uh, testing for the public health lab in order to improve the provincial turnaround time. Uh, that this is a provincial issue is highlighted by the provincial dashboard that the, uh, the ministry maintains. And as you know, Doug for on a 20 tests per day. And this is a huge ramp up for the laboratories. So there's a careful um, review of capacity for all the testing laboratories in Ontario in order to try and reach uh, that target. Okay, I now want to talk about the actual assay. So we use a worst transcriptase PCR. This is really the reference standard that is used by all laboratories in the diagnosis of COVID-19. It includes um, extraction, amplification, and detection. So viral RNA is measured by the cycle threshold, and the cycle threshold is the number of replication cycles required to produce a signal. And the lower the CT, actually the higher the viral load. And I'm just mentioning this because this will be relevant when we discuss a few other things later on in the talk. But what I really wanted to highlight that the detection of the virus depends on multiple factors. It's not just related to the analytical sensitivity and specificity of the test. The pre-analytical factors are very important. So the quality of the collection of the nasal pharyngeal swab is essential so that you have the amount of human DNA and the representative uh, respiratory cells in order to diagnose. 
The type of specimen is also very important. We know that throat swabs have lower sensitivity than MPS. And it also, um, the type of swab can have an impact in terms of the materials that it's made of. The transport media in terms of uh, virus stability also plays a role. And then what is important is the timing of collection from the symptom onset, and we'll talk about that further. And overall, I think I want you to sort of think about it as in terms of the dynamics of viral replication can occur at different specimen sites. And this uh, factors that would uh, impact this would be disease severity and the clinical presentation. So all these factors play a role. And then of course, there is the uh, sensitivity and sens specificity, the accuracy of the assay that is being used. So one of the factors um, for the RT-PCR is the target selection. And I'm just going to highlight, um, this is a um, genomic sequence of the uh, COVID-19 virus. Um, there are multiple targets that have been used. We use the five prime UTR and the envelope. Uh, the first paper um, that was published of uh, RT-PCR was by the Corman group, and they use the RDRP and the envelope. The US CDC uses N1N2, and the commercial assays use a variety of different um, tests. As I mentioned, our respiratory multiplex has a 5-UTR, and the COVID-specific assay has two targets. Um, why the target is important is that um, there can be differences in sensitivity, and we do know that the RDRP is probably the least sensitive target. And from uh, publications, um, the uh, envelope and the N2 are, uh, have very good sensitivity. So what do we mean by sensitivity and specificity? And I think early on when we brought on the test, uh, we were getting this question from clinicians, um, like how good is your, your assay? And so we can look at it in two ways. There's the analytical sensitivity and specificity. And this in particular looks at the limit of detection. And the limit of detection is how many viral copies per ml are required for your assay to pick up the, uh, the uh, virus. We look at limit of detection by looking at either synthetic viral RNA, a whole virus, or uh, clinical specimens. We dilute them and we try and sort that out. We also sort of test using um, reference uh, clinical samples, both positive and negative. And then as uh, more information comes out, we get comparative data to other assays. This is very different than clinical sensitivity and specificity. And the IDSA Diagnostic Test Guidelines just came out on May 6, and as they state, it is still largely unknown what the clinical sensitivity and specificity is. And that's because it's, there is a lack of a standard definition to define COVID-19 disease. So if you used your assay as part of that definition and only that part of it, then you're most likely to inflate the sensitivity of your assay due to incorporation bias. What we're really interested to know is how good is our test in terms of diagnosing COVID-19 disease, not just the presence of the virus. And so the IDSA Diagnostic Test Guidelines have um, recommended that we need a standardized case definition and highlighted the potential for serology to help with that, especially in the setting where their PCR is negative. So uh, in terms of the comparison of different methods, this, act, this information actually has only come out recently. Um, probably from the beginning of April, there have been peer-reviewed publications uh, evaluating the different assays that are out there. The patient population has been symptomatic patients and usually MPS specimens. Um, consistent with uh, all the publications is there is no cross-reaction with a wide variety of the respiratory viruses that are circulating, so that's reassuring. So if we look at the analytical accuracy from the publications, the limit of detection ranges from less than 100 copies per ml to over 100,000 copies per ml. As I mentioned, the RDRP has a slightly lower analytical sensitivity. Uh, different uh, range of commercial assays have been evaluated. And I will focus a little bit on the suffered expert later on, but this has actually an uh, excellent analytical sensitivity. So what about our assay? So early on, uh, we validated this by comparing it to the public health assay, which at the time was with the RDRP and envelope, and our sensitivity was 100%. However, we do want to do further investigation of this now that we have uh, multiple different uh, positive specimens. The ideal would be to look at patient specimens, some at the limit of detection to various assays, to really get a better understanding of the sensitivity. So this will be ongoing. The specificity of our assay is 99%. 
When we did a limit of detection in the laboratory, our different assays range from 1,000 to over 10,000 copies per ml. And the lab is going, um, doing ongoing optimization of extraction methods to continuously improve that LOD. So one of the questions that we, um, that we frequently had was, uh, should we be obtaining a lower respiratory specimen? So this would be a sputum, ETA, or bronch if the MPS is negative. So the IDSA guidelines uh, suggest a strategy of initially obtaining the upper respiratory tract sample. Um, and then only if that is negative and the suspicion is high in a patient that's hospitalized with pneumonia, would you obtain a lower respiratory sample? And what are they basing this on? So these are the two forest plots that they had within their guidelines. And what they had to do is look at those publications where patients were tested very frequently and serially, both with an upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract specimen. Most of this data, I think actually all of this data comes out from China. And if you look at the overall sensitivity of the lower respiratory, it is higher at around 80% and it decreased with the upper respiratory. But as is very visually striking, there's a wide range in terms of uh, sensitivity based on the publication. And I think this relates to the fact that some of these papers use uh, nares and throat, not necessarily MPS, and there may be differences in the MPS swab. And the other thing I wanted to highlight with one of the papers is they also looked at the timing of collection based on symptom onset and disease severity, highlighting that um, if there is uh, um, a multiple days, so greater than seven days from the time of onset, especially in the setting of severe disease with pneumonia, that a lower respiratory tract sample um, may be positive where the upper respiratory is negative. And I think this is consistent with viral dynamics in terms of what we know about replication in the upper respiratory tract versus the lower as disease progresses and you develop pneumonia. We also looked in Hamilton and we took all our data from March to May 1st. And out of that, we were able to find 256 patients who had both a nasopharyngeal swab, either before or at the same time as a lower respiratory. And only two patients were found that had an initial MPS that was negative and a lower respiratory that was positive. One of these patients was very severely immunocompromised. And looking at her chart, her onset of symptoms was two weeks prior to when she was tested. So again, this would fit in with some of the data in terms of testing when, um, there's a, um, when there's a significant number of days from onset. Unfortunately, with the other patient, I wasn't able to access uh, clinical information. So the other question that we also got a lot is, should we, if the MPS is negative, routinely obtain a second MPS? And so the IDSA guidelines, I think, frame this quite nicely. They do say that in the setting of intermediate high suspicion, where the number of false negatives would be above an acceptable threshold, you would consider that. And so if we look at um, the way they presented this data, it really depends on your pretest probability. So if you know that the prevalence in your, that population is quite low, the number of false negatives, even if you use a very conservative estimate of a sensitivity of 71%, which I think is actually quite a bit lower than what our assay is, um, the number of false negatives would probably be uh, acceptable. However, if you have a patient population that you're testing with a pretest probability of 40%, then of course, um, the number of false negatives might not be acceptable. I think what we do have to look at is whether as we get more information in terms of sensitivity, how to apply this, but I think as, and I think most clinicians have been doing this, is it really depends on the pretest probability. Unfortunately, we don't always have good prevalence data in different populations. When we looked at that same um, set of um, patient specimens, uh, overall 19,000 patients were tested in Hamilton and uh, over 1,000 patients had two MPSs within 72 hours. And there were 25 patients who had not had a prior positive MPS, so their first MPS was negative and their second was positive, it was just 25 patients. I think what is interesting though, is that we also use repeat MPS to document recovery and to base um, when we should take a patient out of additional precautions. So the CDC recommends uh, two approaches. You can use a symptom-based strategy to remove additional precautions, which means that you have to have at least 72 hours since recovery and at least 10 days since symptoms first appeared, or you can use a lab-based strategy where you do have symptom resolution, but you need two consecutive negative respiratory specimens collected greater than or equal to 24 hours apart. And for our inpatients, we currently use a lab-based strategy uh, testing at 14 days. 
So this is one area I think we do need to um, look at more evidence. There are two publications that sort of highlight some of the key questions, because as we know, a molecular assay can be positive persistently, and it doesn't mean that the virus is viable and that transmission can occur. So one of the early papers by Wolfel, where they were able to do both molecular and virus culture, found that in a very small number of cases, they only looked at nine, that beyond day eight of illness, the viral cell cultures were negative. In a more recent article, which is quite interesting, they have their own lab-developed assay similar to us using the envelope gene, and they were able to find that the CT value of greater than or equal to 34 were all viral culture negative. Unfortunately, we don't have good data because the organism is a risk group 3, and uh, virus culture requires a BSL level 3 lab. But the CT value greater than or equal to 34 34 would be considered positive in our assay. So I think this is interesting information and maybe as more information develops, we'll be able to come up with a, a preferred strategy in terms of when to take a patient out of additional precautions. I do know from looking at the discordant NPS results that we do have a lot of uh, results that are both positive and negative when we're looking at recovery. And this also highlights that it's probably very much at the limit of detection of our assay. So I just wanted to look at some future um, considerations. And for point of care tests, there was a lot of hype about the Spartan Cube. It's a cute little silver box that's made in Canada. And Health Canada approved it on April 16th, based really on some limited data on limit of detection. Unfortunately, um, uh, Health Canada has had to retract that uh, because of the higher number of false negatives. And it can no longer be used uh, for diagnosis. And it may be related to the fact that the issue was designed really for buccal collection. There are two other um, uh, assays that can be used in the patient care setting outside of the clinical lab, the Abbott ID Now and the Cephid Expert Express. Both have emergency use approval in the US. The Abbott ID Now um, is a pretty familiar assay because it's used for group A strep and influenza and it has a COVID test. It's uh, isothermal amplification with the RDRP. And then the Cephid Express has the N2 in envelope. So there actually are some good publications now that have come out comparing um, the different assays and comparing them to a reference standard, so uh, RT-PCR. And what they found is that the Abbott ID now, unfortunately, had a higher limit of detection and lower sensitivity, but the Cephid Express actually performed very well. So this will be interesting in terms of how to integrate this potentially in um, either remote areas or where you need a more rapid diagnosis or you need more, um, you need testing outside of the clinical lab. So the last part I'm gonna talk about is uh, the very controversial area of should we be testing asymptomatic patients? And I just put on this slide the public health recommendations as of May 14th and the IDSA guidelines, which interestingly were not endorsed by the US Infection Control Group. And it highlights some of the patient populations that we're currently having discussion in terms of should we be doing asymptomatic testing. So I just want to highlight a, um, a few papers of um, the value of asymptomatic testing in high exposure settings. So we do know that um, in family members that have been exposed to a COVID positive patient, that there's a high yield of uh, positive results in asymptomatic patients although most of these are pre-symptomatic and they go on to develop symptoms. We also know from a cluster in Singapore that highlighting the importance of pre-symptomatic transmission um, one to three days before symptom onset and it actually resulted in 6.4% of cases. So they were also able to find that um, uh, asymptomatic uh, contacts um, were detected uh, by screening and it is an important factor in terms of transmission. In a more recent paper, the nursing home facility, um, there was actually a positive uh, healthcare worker that unfortunately worked for two days while symptomatic, so high risk exposure. And in this patient population, when they screened the whole facility, they found that 56% of the asymptomatic cases were actually PCR positive. I think this might, however, reflect that this patient population is very difficult to assess. Um, and um, many of them maybe were symptomatic, but it's hard to know. But these also were mainly pre-symptomatic in that the majority of them did develop symptoms a median, you know, four days after uh, testing. So if we sort of look at asymptomatic as a whole, I think we have to sort of look at it in the context that we really do have limited data on the sensitivity of our assays in asymptomatic patients, 
The published literature is really uh, mainly in symptomatic patients when we compare different assays, although there's some, as I just highlighted, some intriguing papers where they were able to show the importance of asymptomatic testing and uh, high exposure um, uh, contacts. Uh, it does highlight that the value of asymptomatic testing will likely vary based on the prevalence in that patient population and that we have a lack of studies that actually compare strategies of testing versus no testing of asymptomatic persons. And we do have to consider if there is known exposure, of course, they'll be in quarantine. So what is the added value of testing? So with that, I'd just like to thank um, um, many members of the laboratory because this is a team effort. And I'll let Dr. Chetty carry on and talk about serology. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, and uh, thank you, Deb, for the uh, nice uh, overview of uh, molecular testing. So I'm going to be talking about uh, serological testing and uh, what we know and uh, what we wish that we knew. Because we've been getting a lot of questions about, uh, you know, when is serological testing coming to, uh, to our laboratory? So just a very quick uh, overview of uh, Immunology 101. Uh, and, you know, I just wanted to emphasize that there's three levels of uh, virus protection by the uh, immune cells. Uh, the first level is by cytotoxic uh, T cells. So when the virus enters a cell, uh, uh, the, the uh, bits of the virus are expressed on the uh, major histocompatibility complex on the surface of the cells. The T cells recognize them and uh, attract cytotoxic factors that promptly uh, get rid of the, uh, the infected cell. The second line of defense is the secretion of interferons from uh, virally infected cells. Interferons are very important for uh, immune activity and act as signaling molecules as well that further uh, uh, send a message to local cells to express more MHC proteins and in that way attract uh, cytotoxic T cells as well. The third line of defense is antibody production. And although, you know, this is the, uh, the, the level of defense that we actually measure in the, in the, in the blood, uh, we must realize that the defense of the virus can be sometimes mediated by uh, the cell mediated immunity. And we're just beginning to understand the main role of the cell mediated immunity in SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. And just on a pictorial level, uh, the antibody production can be either neutralizing, and you can see very nicely that uh, the antibodies here uh, neutralize the virus so that the virus cannot bind to the ACE2 receptor. Uh, the second class of antibodies are non-neutralizing antibodies. And uh, so they basically, uh, although they bind to the virus, they do not prevent it from entering into the cell. And more importantly, the third type of virus is the uh, pathology enhancing virus that, that can actually uh, promote or exacerbate infection. And uh, this is one of the hypotheses for the uh, cytokine storm syndrome. So from a clinical point of view, when you're measuring the uh, antibodies in the uh, blood, you could, you know, this could represent a neutralizing, non-neutralizing or pathology enhancing uh, antibody status. And as Deb mentioned very nicely, uh, the, the way that we should look at SARS-CoV-2 testing is direct evidence of the virus. And Deb has covered very nicely the molecular uh, aspects of it. I just wanted to highlight one test that it just got approved in the US, the antigen test. And I don't want folks to get confused about this one because although it's an immunoassay, it's still a direct uh, assessment of the virus because there are some proteins expressed on the virus itself. 
and uh, there's antibodies directed uh, against those proteins and it's a point of care device, not as certainly not as accurate as the PCR device. The ones that I'll be concentrating on is the serological tests, uh, and they're called indirect because it's an indirect uh, uh, assessment of uh, the virus past or previous exposure. And here you can see the uh, a pictorial representation of the viral RNA, the antigen, and the antibody uh, production. Uh, and just you know, a very, very brief slide to uh, highlight the different types of assays that are used for antibody tests. So they could vary by format or design. The lateral flow assays are the point of care devices. And here you have a nitrocellular membrane that's impregnated with the uh, various detection and signal antibodies and a finger prick uh, uh, blood is applied to the strip. And the readout is usually a yes or no, so it's a qualitative uh, assay. Uh, and, and the performance of these assays have been very variable and, and, and not uh, optimal. The lab-based methods are ELISA and chemiluminescent methods. And these are capable of very high throughput and much more controlled conditions. The second uh, variable in terms of the assays is could be by which immunoglobulin is detected. And this could be IgM, IgG, IgA, and there's now assays for total antibodies where they have a combined IgA or IgG. And the third differentiating factor is what recombinant epitope is embedded in the, uh, in, in the assay. Uh, so this could be either uh, part of the spike protein, which is, uh, which is the, uh, the main uh, epitope that, uh, that attaches to the ACE2 receptor. So you have the S1 or S2 uh, domains. The S1 domain is more specific for SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. The S2 tends to uh, overlap with other coronaviruses. Certainly the receptor binding domain epitope of the S1 uh, uh, domain of the spike protein is the most specific for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but unfortunately it is heavy, heavily glycosylated and uh, the commercial uh, manufacturers have stayed away from uh, uh, scaling up the production of the receptor binding domain epitope because of the difficulties uh, uh, manufacturing it. And the last antigen is the nucleocapsid. Again, the nucleocapsid uh, uh, antibodies directed against the nucleocapsid uh, antigen are not correlated with neutralizing antibodies. So, so just very briefly again, point of care testing uh, is, is marked by a number of uh, uh, limited clinical validation data and there's uh, variability in performance among different point of care devices. Although it's a rapid test, it's readily available, uh, but at the moment, the Canadian Public Health Laboratory Network has uh, basically put out a statement and uh, point of care serological assays should not be used at the present time for clinical testing until uh, further information becomes available. And uh, the other very important point that I wanted to highlight is that molecular testing uh, such as PCR remains the gold standard, the primary test method for laboratory confirmation of acute uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection and diagnosis of COVID-19. So which antibody should we use? Now there's three antibodies that are increased in SARS-CoV-2 infection. IgM is traditionally a very large molecule. It's produced very early in the infection, but unfortunately it has a large number of false positives. And uh, most manufacturers have not come out with any uh, really good assay for IgM uh, detection. IgG seems to be the best uh, assay right now. Uh, it is directly correlated with the development of neutralizing antibodies and is found in, in the blood and respiratory tract. IgA, uh, again, number of false positives, but has the potential for uh, detection in saliva as well. 
Now, when you look at the literature, SARS-CoV-2 is proven to be a very interesting virus because the antibody responses are quite variable. Uh, some, some studies show that, uh, you know, the combined IgM, IgG assays go up first, uh, and then uh, the IgM, but some other studies show that the IgG uh, increases concurrently with IgM. And the variability may be related to differences in assay design and patient population. Uh, this, this study published in the Lancet uh, followed uh, patients in a longitudinal pattern and measured antibodies to different uh, epitopes. And as you can see on the left panel, the antibody responses uh, occur quite early uh, to, to quite late uh, in the course of the illness. And on the right, what I wanted to highlight here is that there's quite marked variation in the antibody theta levels uh, and, and viral load uh, when it's matched against the viral load. So what does this mean clinically? Is that even if you're testing patients for the antibodies and, uh, the, anti and, and a the antibodies levels are detected, the viral load could still be present. So there's really no good correlation between viral load and the presence of the antibody. So the presence of the antibody could mean two things, past or present infection. The second question, and I think this has gained a popular press uh, recently, is does the presence or teeter of antibodies uh, imply immunity? And uh, just again, another refresher course on uh, neutralizing antibodies. Uh, so these are primarily IgG class antibodies, which independently block the viral entry into whole cells. And not all produced antibodies are neutralizing. And a very, very uh, important point is that the commercial assays that we use do not distinguish neutralizing antibodies from non-neutralizing antibodies. The gold standard method and I'm not gonna go into very much detail, is the plaque reduction neutralization tests. These require a biosafety level three facility, and they're much very tedious and challenging to perform, require a lot of expertise. There's an alternative to the uh, gold standard, the pseudovirus uh, neutralization assay, and uh, these are done in, in level two facilities and they may be uh, the, the tests that may be performed to detect neutralization antibodies. Again, I wanted to highlight that the fact that the teacher of the neutralizing antibodies, uh, we do not know the level which correlates with protective immunity. So what do we know so far about uh, immunity from other coronaviruses? The common coronaviruses that cause the common cold. Uh, the IgG peaks about two weeks post-infection uh, and it returns to baseline by about one year. In a, in a nice experiment, when they re-challenged uh, volunteers with, the, uh, with some of the coronaviruses, 66% uh, of patients shed the virus, but none developed colds. So uh, the protective antibody levels is thought to drop off at two years. So there's a, definitely a hint of uh, protection for the common coronaviruses up to uh, one year. Uh, the SARS uh, epidemic, the, in the SARS epidemic, the antibodies max out three to four months post-infection and they decline to undetectable levels by six years. Although uh, the neutralizing antibodies were detectable up to uh, one year, uh, unfortunately, we were not able to determine if those neutralizing antibodies actually prevented infection because of the short duration of SARS. Uh, even in the uh, Middle Eastern uh, coronavirus, uh, neutralizing antibodies remain uh, for a duration of about three years. What can we say so far about SARS-CoV-2 in terms of uh, immunity? Uh, there's uh, no clinical data, but animal studies in the rhesus monkeys who uh, were infected with the coronavirus and then re-challenged uh, 
with uh, with with exposure to the virus uh, where did not uh, get the did not get infected about one month post infection. Uh, so, so we have very limited data uh, about the role of neutralizing antibodies and how long do they actually last in SARS-CoV-2. But from uh, you know, judging from the previous uh, history with other coronaviruses, we suspect that the immunity is going to be short-lived, perhaps one to two years. The IgG indicates the presence of an immune response. The level and duration of protective immunity against reinfection. Uh, remains unknown. One of the first studies that actually looked at, uh, you know, neutralizing antibodies and SARS-CoV-2 came out from Wuhan, China, uh, and 175 hospitalized patients with mild disease uh, were admitted to the ICU and tested by the pseudovirus uh, expressing S1, S2, or retinal uh, receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2. And, and strikingly, about 6% of patients did not develop neutralizing antibodies. 30%, almost one third, developed low neutralizing antibodies. And counter, counterintuitively, older age uh, patients correlated with higher levels of neutralizing antibody. So again, uh, you know, we, we, we're discovering uh, from recent data as well that the level of antibody that we measure in the blood, uh, IgG does not correlate uh, with the level of neutralizing antibodies. Uh, we've had a few patients with uh, uh, virtually very low TGs of uh, IgG antibodies having very high levels of neutralizing antibodies. So there's really no good correlation between the level uh, of IgG and neutralizing antibodies at this stage. So what is the current status in, in Ontario? Uh, no laboratory in Ontario is currently offering serological testing for COVID-19 uh, diagnosis or, 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 or prevalence data. Uh, just last week, two tests have been approved, the Dysoran and Abbott IgG assay, Health Canada approved. And I must say that, uh, you know, Health Canada has sort of adopted a very, uh, you know, measured approach and uh, compared to uh, the FDA, uh, but the FDA has recently uh, made much more stringent criteria for the approval of kits. Initially, uh, you know, about 200 kits came onto market without any uh, oversight at all. So the tests do have issues with test performance in terms of low sensitivity. Sensitivity, of course, will depend on the timing of sampling. If you do the uh, antibody test too early in the course of illness, uh, they will definitely be negative. Uh, as I said, about five to 10% of patients do not mount an antibody response. And this could be due to the uh, immunocompromised status or the uh, prominent role of cell mediated immunity as opposed to antibody response. So, so although patients, some patients clear the virus, they may not exhibit an antibody response. Specificity does become an issue because of cross-reaction with antibodies and certainly a low positive predictive value when the prevalence is low. In terms of the cross-reactivity, again, uh, there's a very high degree of uh, homology with the SARS virus, as Deb mentioned, uh, and less so with the common coronaviruses. And about more than 90% of adults greater than 50 years will have antibodies to all four coronaviruses, the common coronaviruses. In our assays, uh, the ones that we uh, validated together with data from the uh, National Medical Laboratory in Winnipeg, we did not see any cross-reactivity uh, with the common coronaviruses. However, we did see cross-reactivity uh, with the SARS uh, coronaviruses. The FDA has mandated that we insert a uh, statement that false positive results due to antibodies to common coronaviruses uh, may occur. So again, you know, just to drive home the point about uh, prevalence and positive predictive value, uh, on the left panel, uh, if the prevalence is very low of 1% and you have a very good test of 99% specificity, 
uh, you know, the, you're going to have uh, nine patients who will test positive, confirming COVID-19. But in the COVID-19 negative group, you're going to have uh, 10 patients that will test uh, positive as well, giving you a positive predictive value of 47%. It's just like flipping a coin uh, in a low prevalence uh, uh, area. Whereas if the prevalence is 5%, uh, the positive predictive value increases to about 83%. Now, where do we see the use of uh, uh, serological tests? I think the, the main uh, focus for these tests will be on the uh, surveillance and prevalence strategies to inform uh, future preventative uh, efforts uh, uh, province-wide so they can, use, they can be used to estimate uh, population exposure, uh, specifically to determine the true prevalence in the population and also to target uh, uh, high-risk groups like healthcare workers, uh, long-term care facilities, marginalized populations, and, uh, and that will inform uh, preventative efforts uh, for the future if and when we see a second surge. Uh, as Deb mentioned, uh, the asymptomatic group is, is, is quite a big group as well. And what is the dynamics of, uh, of uh, prevalence of infection in this group, certainly the serological tests will help uh, define that population better. I just did a very quick uh, survey of current seroprevalence studies so far. You can imagine this, is, uh, this disease is only uh, four and a half months old. So the data are very uh, uh, scant to say the least. And, and, and quite, a, quite a number of studies have not been peer reviewed. Uh, uh, but just to get a cursory glance at these studies, uh, you know, the healthcare workers uh, in Spain, for example, uh, the prevalence of uh, the coronavirus using a combined assay, IgG, IgA, or IgM, uh, was 2.3% 2, 2 with no past history of COVID, 6.7% uh, with a history of uh, previous COVID. And the cumulative prevalence was defined as PCR positive plus antibody presence was about 11%. But other studies like uh, healthcare workers working in a COVID ward in Germany uh, only had about a 1.6% uh, prevalence. Uh, in, a, in a randomly selected population in the community, large number of patients uh, using a lab-based method, the prevalence was 1.79%. Uh, so again, you know, uh, at the moment, only time will tell, you know, what the prevalence rates uh, will be in terms of uh, the, uh, the infection rate. So what about a, at an individual level? Because this becomes quite an interesting question, and I've already had about 20 requests so far, uh, you know, uh, with, with patients saying that, you know, I definitely felt a bit sick. And uh, I am convinced that I had COVID-19. Uh, can I get a test uh, to determine if I was exposed to COVID-19 previously? Again, this, you know, until we know uh, for certain what the actual uh, numbers mean in terms of uh, conferring immunity, how long does it last? I think these are the, the type of tests that we should not perform at the moment. Uh, at an individual level, uh, we could certainly offer improved diagnostic capacity for patients uh, with a high clinical index of suspicion of uh, COVID-19, uh, especially when the PCR tests negative. And the second uh, indication is to determine eligibility for convalescent plasma donation in the future and uh, as a measure of e effectiveness for vaccine development. And again, you know, uh, this is the, the latest stage of uh, the, uh, you know, when PCR is negative because of decreased viral load in the NPS swabs, uh, patient presenting with pneumonia, for example, PCR negative. This is where I think the testing uh, is gonna have a, a valued uh, usage. So can these tests be used as surrogates for reopening? Uh, 
currently the utility of, of serological tests as a tool for re reopening is limited. Uh, we do not know whether these tests confer immunity and there is a risk of false positives. And as I said, uh, the, the, the prevalence is very, very important when assessing uh, the, true, uh, uh, the true prevalence rates and relaxing public health measures before herd immunity is achieved is one of the uh, concerns that could be uh, that 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 could be inherent in offering these tests uh, to 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 a number of patients. And lastly, the ethical issues become very important. Uh, you know, stigmatizing groups with high positivity rates and limiting work opportunities for those who test negative. So certainly, I do not believe that. Uh, they should be used as a surrogate uh, for reopening. Now, what's going on in a, the HRLMP? Uh, you know, we've validated uh, two uh, kits, Euroimmune and Diasoran assays, the IgG assays. Uh, we have found the sensitivity above 15 days from symptom onset to be in the range of 91%. Specificity was about 100%. Fortunately, we had samples from uh, pre-COVID pre era, and we were able to uh, 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 use these samples for determining specificity. At the moment, we are waiting uh, laboratory licensing, because this is something that we have to obtain. The Diasoron kit, as I said, has, has received Health Canada approval. We have already uh, uh, encountered supply chain issues, and I think, this is why we want to keep two uh, assays available. And the last point that I wanted to emphasize is that we want to align ourselves with the provincial strategy as well. Uh, uh, a group of us are part of a provincial strategy task force, and uh, we are trying to uh, make sure that there's not going to be a flood of this testing uh, because you know if if uh, individuals start to demand this test, we have to have a way of actually uh, uh, directing these tests to the right indications and the right uh, uh, patients. So once this test is, uh, is available in, uh, through the HRLMP, a memo will be circulated shortly. And just to emphasize that we did meet all the FDA requirements uh, in terms of both sensitivity and specificity. So for the comments section, uh, when these tests become available, uh, again, you know, we want to emphasize for negative results, uh, a negative result does not exclude acute SARS-CoV-2 infection. And they may occur in serum collected too soon following infection in Im immunocompromised patients or in some individuals with prior mild illness. For positive results, Positive results may be due to past or present infection with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the result certainly does not confirm immunity to SARS-CoV-2 and false positive results due to antibodies to other coronaviruses uh, may occur. So again, uh, you know, this was a large undertaking with uh, numerous collaborators uh, and uh, both clinical and from the technical point of view, and we did collaborate with a number of hospitals, uh, you know, Grand River, William Osler, Humber, and Public Health uh, Ontario. So just to summarize uh, in, in, in three points is that I, I do believe that COVID serology is gonna play a very important role uh, in, in particularly in, in prevalence and surveillance of populations and informing uh, preventative uh, strategies that we could use in, in high risk populations. And secondly, it's going to play a very important role in improving our diagnostic capacity, uh, particularly when PCR is uh, negative, patients who are presenting late uh, with pneumonia, uh, et cetera. And, and, and quite interestingly, we received recently a few requests in the pediatric population uh, with uh, sort of COVID uh, toes and the pediatric inflammatory syndrome. So, we, we, we might see an increased use of tests in that group as well. So with that, I'm going to say thank you and uh, we look forward to any questions. Thanks very much, Deb and, and Tony. That was a great conference set of rounds. We're, we're right at nine o'clock and we do try to finish right around nine. So what I'll do maybe is 
I'll just ask one of the questions that came out of the chat and we'll end it there. And I think people who want to ask questions specifically, I see DVV has his hand up. Maybe you could just address it directly to the two of you. So the one question I'll ask is actually to both of you, are there any viral antigen tests coming along? Is there any utility in, in that? Okay. I, uh, yeah, so I can speak to that and then Deb can, uh, I did mention at the beginning, uh, that the viral antigen tests uh, are available in the U.S. Uh, in the form of a point of care device. So this is a, this is a direct detection of the uh, virus. So there's uh, antigens, the M antigen, the S antigen are present on the surface of the virus, and there's an immunoassay uh, to detect uh, these uh, these antigens. The test itself. Uh, is not very accurate. So even if a patient tests negative and has symptoms, they will need uh, PCR uh, uh, testing as well. But if it's positive, the positive predictive value is high, uh, but negative predictive value, uh, patients will certainly need to have PCR testing as well. But not, I, it's not yet available in Canada. Yeah, so I guess that was the question. Do you see it having a clinical utility in, in the HRLMP or in Hamilton at any point in the future, either Deb or Chip Tony. I, I, I would, you know, having run the labs for a while, I would think that there's no role for it. People always want to get point of care tests because they sound cool, but I'm not sure that actually has a lot of utility in this setting unless you were using it as a rapid diagnostic test. Do you, Deb, do you have any comments? No, I mean, I, I um, what Tony indicated in terms of the limited accuracy, I, I would just reinforce that. And I think if we are looking at point of care tests, it would be the uh, molecular point of care test with a um, PCR. So the one that looks um, the best so far in the literature is the uh, Cephrid Express. Um, so that's the gene expert one. Okay, well, we'll end it there. Sorry, I didn't get to the question. There's lots of round, lots of questions in the in the text, and also there's people with their hands up. But uh, we'll uh, just maybe defer those questions, and you guys could be asked uh, directly. So thanks very much, uh, Dr. Yammer, Dr. Chetty, for presenting a great set of rounds. Really helpful, and I think cleared up a lot of questions that I and others are asking and getting asked about the reliability and the predictive value of the testing that we're doing. And I think a little bit of positive news from Tony about the protective immunity, but a little bit of depression there about the fact that even if we do get protective immunity, we may be subject to this every couple of years, which will cause us a lot more excitement over the coming years. So thanks very much to both of you, and uh, we look forward to rounds next week. Thanks. And oh, the code this week is uh, 7415 for those of you who are on the phone, 7415. Thanks. Bye.